Divide and Conquer, published at the Outpost of Freedom on August 16th, 2009. In war, in battlefield combat, one of the most important strategies, especially if the enemy has superior numbers, is to divide and conquer. Very briefly, it can be explained that if you have a force of 3,000 and the enemy has a force of 4,000, you will probably be defeated in combat. However, if you can cause him to divide his forces into two groups, each having about 2,000 men, you have gone from 25% less men against his entire force to a 50% advantage over one of the divided forces. Once the first unit is defeated, the second unit can be attacked with much greater odds than if an attack was made on the entire force at the outset. The same is true of the psychological warfare America is embroiled in today and the political warfare that has begun to divide the country and our own patriot community. Here are just some of the singular objectives that are commonly pursued today. Legal Solutions Objective 1. Sovereign Citizens A valid exercise that, when completed, frees you from U.S. citizenship. Once freed, however, you have to be vigilant and careful. A misstep may land you in jail or worse. If you manage to establish your credentials in your home community, you will have to repeat the education of law enforcement and judicial officers when you leave your local area. This will be a perpetual battle for rights retained by the Ninth and Tenth Amendments. If millions were to adopt this status, what would change regarding the other evils of government? The problem is that the unconstitutional 14th Amendment to the Constitution, allowed by the Congress, the Executive, and the Courts, created a fictional relationship between our public servants and ourselves. The effect was to make them master and us the servant. Objective 2. Show me the law! IRS and the Federal Income Tax. Though there are a number of reasons why the income tax, as applied, is illegal or unconstitutional, there are many who have ended up in prison, or dead, in their efforts to avoid this unlawful imposition on our lives and property. To their credit, probably millions do not pay income taxes. Will this change anything other than how much of what one earns they are allowed to retain? It absolutely will not. With all of those who have moved out of the system, there has still been no substantial change to the nature of imposition and collection of this tax. The government needs the tax, the benefits and deductions, so they can socially engineer the society. It has nothing to do with the government's need for the money, and everything to do with teaching us that they control our very lives. The problem is that Congress has given an administrative agency, the IRS, power over our lives without regard to the constitutional restrictions on taxation. Objective 3. Uniform Commercial Code, UCC. The Uniform Commercial Code was adopted by nearly every state back in the 50s or 60s. Its purpose was to have a set of rules easily understood and established with the purpose that consumers would be able to understand their relationship to merchants, lenders, etc., and know where they stood and what their rights were in a transaction. It was implemented by being enacted in near pure form into the statutes of the respective states. There were a number of provisions that definitely benefited the consumer. One was that when you made a payment, the postmark date of that payment had to be accepted as the date of payment by the lender. This has been overridden by the legislatures, and now the lender can even hold your payment for a few days before recording it, which often throws the borrower into an overdue status and attaches the penalties that apply to overdue payments. 
Though beneficial, when implemented, it has become more of a tool for the commercial interests and means by which they can screw us out of penalties, add charges on top of charges, and generally run the show. This, like CPS, is administered by the states. Congress tends to support the changes to credit card laws with a total disregard for the consumer. The problem is that the Congress had, at first, encouraged enactment and acceptance of the UCC. Then they turned their backs on the intended purpose and allowed lobbyists to encourage changes that took away the protections and passed laws contrary to the UCC. In reviewing these issues and realizing what the outcome of each will provide as a result, we can see that we are facing a myriad of tasks, none or few of which will result in more than a very singular solution to a very singular problem. If, after years of effort, a battle, which has been waged, is won, leaving no residual to encumber us into a continuation of that battle, we can then choose another battle to pursue. However, who is to believe that if a battle is won finally and decidedly, that another objective will not appear to take its place? The division of our forces is inherent in the struggle as we are pursuing it, each due to his personal ideology, has chosen one or another of the objectives and is willing to give 100%, not realizing the futility of even success in that battle once the battle is completed. Is there an alternative course that can achieve all of the objectives? If we were in a battlefield where an effort has been made to divide the forces, giving advantage to the enemy, we would, if our objective was to win and we had superior forces, refuse to divide our force. The enemy would have anticipated being successful in creating the division, as they most certainly believed to be the case, and would not anticipate an all-out attack on their main base, leaving them divided simply by believing that we were divided. In this psychological or political war that we are engaged in, what strategy would overcome the division that has given such an advantage to the enemy? Could it be to concentrate our forces on a single issue? Most assuredly, it would be unsuccessful, since, even though that battle may be won, it would only lead us to the next battle, and the next, and eventually, to defeat. Would we rather pay lip service to George Washington, or would we rather do that which is necessary to achieve the removal of a despotic government? He was willing to do what was necessary to expel those who resisted allowing freedom and liberty to prevail in the land. He supported those peaceful efforts when there was hope for them to succeed. When that hope was gone, though, he chose the only course that remained. When peaceful methods had convinced the Founding Fathers that they would be of no avail, the efforts were stepped up to force the hand of the despotic government. Surrender was not in their vocabulary. The desire of the despots to retain control was the force that was necessary to compel the colonists to risk all when all else had failed. We have tried petitions. We have tried demonstration. We have been ignored by those in power for every effort we have exerted. Perhaps now is the time to extend our efforts into physical effort. Create displeasure and discomfort for those in power and those who support them. In addition, we must be sincere and methodical, 
For if we fail in this effort, there remain but two choices, victory by force of arms or defeat by failure to be willing to fully commit to the cause.